Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterson, and whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing a man named John Altinger and he was the victim of the Dexter inspired killer. Are you familiar? But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both brighter seen, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done essentially begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now, this is a case that I've wanted to cover for a while. I learned about it in like the last maybe two years or so, and it was always on my list to cover. It's one that's just kind of been there, like, oh, I'll get to it eventually, I'll get to it eventually. Whenever the muses take me, because there's a lot of resources on this case, and I have to deep dive and read so many things. So I was kind of waiting until the time felt right. And right now, the time just feels Right, the muses have taken me. Holocene just ended, so we're getting kind of out of the creepy thing, but this still sort of has a spooky vibe because it's like somebody emulating a TV serial killer, Dexter. And also this guy, the murderer, ended up being arrested on Halloween. So it's sort of like a good transition video for us today. So basically what happened here is in 2008 in Canada, this is a Canadian case, 38 year old John Altinger left his house um, in hopes of meeting a woman that he had met on a dating site. They'd been talking for a while, so he was gonna finally go and meet her in person. But when he got there, he found that he had been catfished by a very, very dangerous man. This was a man that was a filmmaker by day and a wannabe serial killer by night. And his inspiration for his serial killer persona was Dexter. Now, if you haven't seen Dexter, one, you should, but I will say in advance, I am so sorry for the finale and really, quite frankly, the whole last season. And two, Dexter is a serial killer who only murders other bad guys, other murderers, so he can sometime, somehow, excuse me, justify what he does and what he is because he's killing bad people, so that makes him better than the average murdering bear. And that is the man that John Altinger's murderer was basing his crimes off. It's crazy. With that said, I'm going to tell you the whole story today. And while I do, I'm going to be putting on a face of makeup, hence the uh, makeup in morbid makeup. Now, if that's not your thing, thanks for hanging out this long. It was cool. You seem fun. Uh, I hope you find a channel that you like more. But if you're kind of on the fence, like, I don't know how I feel. Seems a little weird. Stick around. I think you could be surprised by how much you like Anyways, <laughs> let's just get into it. Gather around, come in close, and I'll tell you the story of John Altinger, the unfortunate victim of the Dexter-inspired killer. First, I obviously want to start by talking about who John Altinger was. There isn't a ton of information on him out there, but I did find some useful articles that gave me some insight into who he was as a person. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about him now. John was born in April of 1970, and he was the youngest child to his mother, Elfride, and his brother, Gary, who was seven years older than him, had actually asked his mom for a baby Johnny, quote unquote, a baby Johnny. So that's exactly why she ended up landing on the name John. As John got older, he remained a bachelor and he had his own place, complete with a giant couch, long enough for two adults to lie on, which I love. That was like the one thing my husband requested when we got a new couch and we moved into our apartment was it just had to be massive. At the time that he was murdered, John was 38 years old, and he was just known as being a helpful man. Friends and family describe him as quiet and affectionate, giving and warm, and he was a man who loved new technology his entire life, especially computers. He got his very first computer at the age of just 12, even though at the time at-home computers were sort of in their infancy. He loved computers and he had a knack for them and just loved what they could do and how they opened up the world. He wanted to be among one of the first people to actually own one. As he got older, the interest lasted and he ended up being in online computer groups and forging friendships that lasted years that started online and sometimes spilled over into his personal life. John's brother Gary said of John's love for computers during his victim impact statement, and I quote, countless times he would sacrifice his own responsibilities to rescue me by word processing term papers, essays, and other important assignments while I was attending university." End quote. 
And I just feel like that statement is a really good example of John's friendliness, his helpfulness, and his love for technology all wrapped up in one. In addition to loving computers, John was also a biker, motorcycles. He owned two and they were like his babies. He took very good care of them and he was also an avid paintballer, even owning his own gun. John had a job that was close to his home. He worked the overnight shift at an oil field equipment manufacturer and he would be in charge of quality control, checking the machine parts at night and working the overnight shifts. He was also a man who had some spiritual beliefs, like he believed in reincarnation, though he was still searching. He'd go to different spiritual meetings or public city walks and would just take in information and just kind of see what touched him. So now that we know who he was, let's move on to October of 2008. And this day was the Friday before Canadian Thanksgiving, which I believe means that it was the 13th. And that meant it was going to be a long weekend for Canadians because how uh, Americans take off the fourth Thursday of each November for Thanksgiving uh, in Canada, they take off the second Monday of each October. I don't know if you knew that, but that was new information for me. So uh, the more you know. But that just meant he was going to have a long weekend because it was Friday and he was going to have a Saturday, Sunday and Monday. So he was probably stoked. I'm sure every, everyone's stoked to have long weekends, you know? Looking forward to just being able to have some free time and do the things you want to do. And of these things that John wanted to do was to go on a date with a pretty lady that he had recently been corresponding with. On this night, that's exactly what John Altinger was doing. He was getting himself ready for a hot date. He had met this woman online. They'd been talking for a while and he was going to go out. It was Friday night, date night. You know how it goes. But sadly, John would never come home again. John had met this woman on the website Plenty of Fish. He'd been a user, a patron of this website for a while. And he met other women. He'd gone out on other dates, but none of them really panned out as like serious romantic interest. But he did stay friends with a lot of these women and built like lasting friendships off of the off of the internet. Yeah, offline, offline friends, real life friends from meeting them on this website. So it was like a good website for him. A friend of his, a woman that he had actually met on the Plenty of Fish website in 2006 said of John, and I quote, he loved to get people to open their minds and think outside the box. He was a positive, upbeat person who tried to get people to turn their negative thoughts into positive thoughts. After John went missing, pieces of the puzzle just didn't really seem to make sense. First, John and this woman had like really hit it off very seriously and very fast. And this could have totally been normal. This isn't that weird of a thing. But when police talked to John's friends, they found that most of his friends felt really weird about the situation. So John and this woman had met this woman who called herself Jen on Plenty of Fish, right? And the whole time his friends thought it was a little weird. Maybe she wasn't taking it too seriously. Maybe she wasn't even real because she just seemed too hot for like any of them. She seemed completely out of all of their leagues and not in like a bad way. It's not like they didn't think highly of their friend. They were just kind of like, this seems like a very odd pairing. So they actually believed that he might've been being catfished. And if that wasn't already weird enough for John's friends, which it was, um, so <laughs> what made it weirder to them is that John was going to be meeting her on Friday night at seven, right? Totally normal. Nothing to see here. Nothing odd, except for that it was really odd because they weren't going to meet at like a restaurant or at the movies or at her house. She gave him instructions to meet her at a garage and he'd have to go through all these weird ways to get there. It was like a puzzle, like solve these little clues and you can find me that sort of thing. And they found that to be particularly odd as well. So apparently one of John, when of John's friends, apparently one of John's friends felt particularly weird about this encounter. And this was John's friend, Dale. This was actually a friend that he had met in kindergarten. So they went way back and Dale felt weird about the whole thing. So he's like, you know what? Fine. Go see if you can meet this woman and have, you know, a relationship, whatever, but do me a favor, text me when you get there, send me the address. So I just know that you've gotten there safe. And I'm like, Dale, that is a good friend right there. That is the thing that you should do as a friend. I don't care if it's men with men. I don't even want to get into this. When I was in Vegas with my friends, I was like, where is your um, hammer drunk friend? They're like, I don't know. He walked off. And I was like, you just let him walk off. That's not what you do. Maybe this is just like the um, true crime person in me. But I was like, you don't let your drunk friends just walk off alone ever. I don't care if you're a man. I don't care if you're a woman. This is what you should do. And maybe I'm biased because this is the type of thing that I would do. And this is the type of thing I want my friends to do. But I'm just very cautious. When I get in an Uber, I text my husband the, the photo of the car, the driver, the license plate, just so that I can try to 
Stay alive. Stay alive. John's friend Dale said of the entire encounter after the fact, and I quote, the instructions were out of the ordinary. It didn't have an address. It was instructions to meet behind the back of a garage. I wasn't too happy about the instructions and I told John to give me a call when he got there and to give me the address before he went into the place. So John never texted his friend that night. He did actually end up calling his friend though. And he called his friend that night and he was a little bit, you know, probably bummed out because he said that he he never found this woman Jen. He said he followed all the instructions and got to the garage that she had instructed him to go to. And when she when he had like went in, it was like partially open, he ducked in. He saw instead a man there, a man who had like a camera and a fake gun, like something super sketchy. And the man told him like, I'm here filming a movie. What are you doing here? And so John just naturally dipped. So he was a little bit bummed out and he was a little bit like, man, I didn't get to meet my lady. Wish I had met my lady. My lady. The two friends then hang up and Dale kind of puts it out of his mind. No big deal. You know, he called, he was fine. He didn't meet up with her and thought it was nothing. That is until he received an email from John later that night. Not a call, not a text, but an email. And at first I thought that was weird, but then I remembered that everyone said that John was a big computer guy and he sent a lot of emails. So this isn't that weird, but he sent an email to Dale just saying like, JK, big mix up. I found her and I'm going over now. Catch you later. I'm going to see this lady. <laughs> the email actually said specifically, she's home now. I'm heading over. He he. And I don't know what it is about the he he, but it makes me like, cause it's like, I know who this person was. I, I know a John, you know what I mean? And it just makes me sad. It just makes me sad. Oh man. But now, now I'm thinking like, once we get to the end of this case, you'll understand. But now I'm wondering if that even was John, that probably wasn't John. So now I'm saying that I know a, well, his name's Mark. We'll get to that later. I don't want to spoiler alert you too much, but now I'm like, my wheels are turning wheels are turning. Anyways, John's friend, even though he received this email and John was known to send a lot of emails, he still felt weird about this particular email. So he decided before going to bed, he was going to call John one more time and just kind of check in. They, they, they seemed like they were really good friends. So he was just going to like check in, make sure everything was cool. But when he called the phone, just rang and rang and rang and he never got through to John. I'm assuming he was like, well, he's with a woman. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But they never connected again. Over the next couple days, John's friend, Dale, good old Dale, good old vigilant, great friend, Dale, just felt really weird that he hadn't spoken to John. He tried calling him over and over and all day on Saturday, he got no response. And this was stressing him out. He was worried about his friend. So he even called um, another mutual friend asking if they had heard from John and no one had heard from John. Spoiler alert. No one heard from John. It was the following day, Sunday, that Dale really got worried because Dale and John had plans that morning to go on a motorcycle ride. I guess that John was actually going to even be teaching Dale some pointers because John was more um, experienced in motorcycle riding. And this is just not something that John would have missed. I don't know if you know any bikers, but going on morning rides, they love that shit. <laughs> I don't want to generalize, but the bikers that I know love that shit. For the record, I wish that I didn't know any bikers and not because I don't like bikers because they're fine. I don't like motorcycles because I don't want anyone I love to die. So I wish that none of my friends rode them. That's end rant. My husband wants one. And I was like, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're not going to widow me, leave me alone with this baby to raise by myself. Absolutely not. So at this point, Dale is really freaking out. I think like before, I think he took his, um, his worry seriously, but he was probably trying to like rationalize it, try not to expect the worst thing in the world. But at this point he's like, no, I am onto something. Something is weird here. So after having Thanksgiving dinner with his family, cause I guess even though the Thanksgiving is on the Monday, some people eat their, their, I don't know what they eat in Canada, but I'm going to say Turkey. I don't eat Turkey because I'm a vegetarian, but I know most people in America eat turkey and I know nothing of Canadian Thanksgiving. Anyways, he ate his Thanksgiving dinner with his family and then him, his wife and another friend all pile in a car and they mob on over to John's apartment. And when they get there, they find that everything seems normal. It's all locked up, closed up, and John is nowhere to be found. 
So after knocking on the door, peering in windows and seeing that nothing seems odd there, they make their way to the resident parking garage to um, see if John's car is there. And that's when they find that John's car is missing. It is gone, but his motorcycle, motorcycles, I want to say motorbikes, his motorcycles are there. He has two motorcycles. They're both left there and they're both left there uncovered. Now, to me, I would not have saw this and thought that it was weird just because I know nothing of motorbikes. But Dale saw this and was like, oh, hell no, absolutely not. Something is definitely up because apparently, if you know motorcycles, you would never leave your bikes uncovered. If you were going away for more than a day, you would cover these bikes. And John, apparently very big on bikes, always did. And on the off chance that he was going to go away for whatever reason, for a couple of days, he would have asked Dale to come and take care of his bike. So he was like, something's not fucking right here, quite frankly. Now, even though Dale was freaked out after finding this, he did not go immediately to the police. And I don't know why. I couldn't figure out why he chose not to. But either way, he did not. And I think he found that not going to the police was justified when the next morning he was able to breathe a sigh of relief because he got on his computer and he found that he had a message, an email from his good friend, John. When he opened the email, he found that the message from John said that essentially he met Jen, the date went super duper well, like they were super totally into each other and that they had decided upon first meeting that they were so into each other that they wanted to run off together to Costa Rica where Jen owned a home that they were going to be there for two months. And like later player, I'm going on a tropical vacation with my new woman. Seems totally normal, totally reasonable, right? To meet somebody, think they're hot and run off to Costa Rica to stay in like their uh, summer home, right? Totally cool. Totally normal. Except for that it wasn't. And Dan was immediately like, <laughs> what the hell? Like, absolutely not. This isn't him. Not only did the email just not sound like John. Apparently he said that like, you know, if you know somebody, you talk to them a lot, you text them a lot, you email them a lot, you know how they write their writing style, the words they use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, apparently this email sounded nothing like John. And in addition to that, he was going to be in Costa Rica for two months and John hated traveling, sunshine, spontaneity. It wasn't his thing. So this seemed very unlikely for John to do, quite frankly, which I mean, I get because if, um, and just so you guys know, if any day I disappear and I'm on a tropical vacation with somebody I just met with no planning, I'm probably dead because I'm a Virgo moon and I have to plan everything. I'm not going to do anything on a whim. That's crazy. Dale being smart as hell, quite frankly, is like, okay, I'm going to test this theory. My theory being that this is not John who's speaking to me. So he responds to this email and it's like, cool, cool, cool. You're going away. That sounds great. Who's going to pick your brother up from the airport though? Cause like, remember he's coming in and like, so who's going to pick him up since you were supposed to do that. And now you're gone. And this was not true. He had a brother, as I said, his brother's name's Gary, but Gary was not um, coming in at all. This was just Dale's way of trying to trick this person. If it was not John into responding and incriminating themselves. Okay. He was literally trying a straight up, Hey Janelle, what's wrong with Wolfie? I can hear him barking. T2. Never mind. It's fine. Moving on. Anyways, uh, he sends this email and he gets absolutely no response. So he doesn't even get to test his theory, which is a bummer. Cause that was like a really good idea and a good theory. Um, a good, uh, <laughs> what? Anyways, he sends this email and he gets absolutely no response, which is a bummer. Cause I'd be excited. I'd be like the gotcha moment, but he didn't get to have his gotcha moment. Um, he gets no response and he's like, okay, this is crazy. And this is when he calls police. So Dale speaks to police who do not take the situation seriously at all. They're like, he's a grown man. He's 38 years old. He can disappear if he wants. And so an official police report was not filed, which is stupid. <laughs> so shortly after this, shortly after Dale tries to report John missing and is unable to do so, John actually starts making appearances online again, which gives Dale, I imagine a little bit of peace. Uh, John gets on, he updates his Facebook account. He posts like on his wall or whatever. He deletes his plenty of fish, um, page. It definitely does seem like he's met someone and he's, you know, out getting tanned in Costa Rica. What you do when you, when you meet someone, I guess. And John even uh, updates his MSN, like a way message. And it said, and I quote, I've got a one way ticket to heaven and I'm not coming back. But this only lasts a day, maybe two. And then it's dead silence again. And Dale's like, you know what? This is 
horseshit. Sure, he got online, but he never emailed me back. Me and him are fucking bros, dude. We're tight like this. And he's just gone. So then he calls the police again, and this time they're like, fine. We'll take the missing persons report. You hang tight. We'll send an officer to you. Don't, don't call me. I'll call you. But they never show up. <laughs> they never show up. Two days later, Dale's like, you know what? Fuck this noise. And he and a bunch of friends actually get in the car and mob on over back to John's house again. And this time they're actually able to get in through an unlocked window. And when they get in, they find some things in John's home that would probably be very useful to him if he was going on a trip overseas to Costa Rica. Like his passport, his suitcase, his shaving kit, all things you may need if you were going overseas. So they take this to police and they're like, look at this. You still think he's gone? And this is when police finally take an official report and start investigating the disappearance of John Altinger. So police start to investigate, and this is when they quickly decide, quickly find actually, that uh, his friends aren't crazy. They've been saying something that's relevant because things are a little bit weird. First off, no one, not a single person has heard from John. No friends, no family nobody and there was no sign of his car you know like at an airport or at a bus station something that would show that he had you know left to costa rica and like left his car there when he got his car's just gone it's just missing it's not like he drove to costa rica and speaking of costa rica there was also no proof that he had ever even flown there and it's not like he would have been able to do so easily without his passport anyway john had just seemingly vanished into thin air after trying to meet this woman on a date. Police then decide they're going to investigate further and they decide that they want to retrace all the steps that John made on the night that he last spoke to Dale, the last night he spoke to anyone. So they follow the steps, they follow the instructions that John had taken and they end up at that, that garage, the same garage that John presumably ended up at when he was going to meet Jen. So they're standing in front of this garage and like, this is fucking weird. We should try to figure out what we can about this because nobody was there. They couldn't speak to anybody. Nobody like lived in the garage. So they start talking to neighbors. This is when they find out that none of the neighbors have heard of anyone named Jen who rents this garage or lives anywhere near them. So the police are like, what is going on? Who is Jen? What happened to John? This is all very strange. I can't even imagine what police would be thinking at this point. Like, they end up at this garage, a garage that they are pretty sure John had ended up at since John had told Dale that he had been at a garage. And I just can't imagine what, like, what they were thinking happened, like, what their running theory was. Because if I didn't know the story, which I do, I don't know what I would think was going on. I'd just be like, this is very odd. But anyways, um, police also learned from neighbors that it wasn't Jen as I said, who had rented this garage, but it was a man, a 31 year old man named Mark Twitchell, who had been renting the space to create a movie. So police call this Mark guy to see what he knew. If he knew anything, if he had seen anything, if he knew Jen, if he remembered seeing John that night, since John did say that he had run into a guy who was filming a movie in the garage and Mark super helpful, super nice guy, answered all their questions, was like, no, I don't know a Jen, I don't remember seeing a guy, but if you'd like, I can come to the garage and I can open it for you and you can look around if that would be helpful. So he was just like a very accommodating and helpful dude. And police were like, yes, absolutely. If you could come, that would be wonderful. We would love to search this garage since we do think this is the last place he was. So Mark arrives, he meets officers at the garage and he starts walking towards the garage. And this is when he quickly notices that the lock on the outside of the garage that was like holding it closed was not his lock. And he told police this and they were all like, huh, that's really weird that there's a lock that's not yours on your garage. But police are able to get this lock open. And when they do, the very first thing they're hit with is a very bad smell. And I know immediately you're gonna be like, oh fuck, there's a dead body in there. But no, it wasn't the smell of death. It was actually the smell of something being burnt. Police enter and inside the room, they find that all the windows had been blocked off, um, like covered, presumably because um, it was a movie set and they wanted to keep out light and keep people from looking in. And inside the room, there was one giant metal table sitting in the direct center of the room. On the table that was in the center of the room, there was a receipt, a receipt for a bunch of things that one might use, presumably to clean up a crime scene, like paper towels, rubber gloves, plastic sheeting, 
Yikes. And at that point, Mark could have been like, whoa, what the fuck is this? That's not mine. I've never seen that before. But instead he tells police like, hey, I know that this list looks like it could be some super weird stuff. I get that. But it's actually a lot more innocent than it seems because I'm not filming just any type of uh, silly old movie in here. I am filming a horror movie. And in this horror movie, we used a lot of fake blood, fake blood that was made from, from cornstarch. <laughs> the same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry. He didn't say that. Billy Luma said that, and now I said that. Okay. Police actually seem to believe Mark at first, but they still ask him if he wouldn't mind coming down to the station and giving his statement in writing so that they could have it for their investigation, for their file. And Mark's like, absolutely, yes, I would love to do that. And he comes down, he's super cooperative. He answers all their questions. He even offers up additional information. He's like very um, chatty, one might say. Mark talks about his life, his work, his wife, his kid. He's just talk, talk, talking. And they end up thinking he's cool. Nothing too weird. Seems like a normal guy. And they let him go. But even though they let him go, even though they think he's like a cool guy and probably doesn't seem like he'd be a good suspect, doesn't really give them the vibe of like, I killed this person. They still think it's odd and they can't get it out of their heads that like, John goes missing after ending up at a garage where a bloody horror movie was being filmed and that it's not related at all. It just seems far too, too, far too far-fetched. Jesus crust, Jesus crust. It just seems very unlikely and impossible, but not very likely that they're not related at all. So police decide they wanna just look a little more into Mark, find out who he was, find out more about his movie in particular, okay? And this is when they find out something crazy, what this movie's about, what this short film is about, okay? What they find is that this horror movie is about a serial killer. This is a serial killer who is a police officer. And this serial killer kills bad men, but not normal bad men. He kills men who are unfaithful husbands. And he lures in his victims by pretending to be hot women on dating profiles, websites. Like Plenty of Fish, like the one that John used to meet Jen. Which already seems super weird. When these men would show up for their date with their hot babe, they wouldn't meet a hot babe. They would meet a man in a mask who would then attack them and torture them to get their passwords, banking information, all of that before killing them. And the reason this murderer would do this, would torture them and get all their information is so that they could appear, it could appear <laughs> that the victims were alive well after they were dead because the serial killer would then like get on their social media, use their bank card, things like that to make it seem like they were still alive. Does this sound familiar to you? Police also find through their investigation that Mark is a big old fan of Dexter, like Dexter's biggest fan, posts about him on, post about him on Facebook. He posted about him on Facebook all the time. He watched every episode. Dexter was his shit, which if you heard like the serial killer in his movie, it seems a lot like Dexter, who was a blood spatter analyst for the Miami Police Department instead of a police officer. Oh no, I did the tongue click thing. Some of you said you don't like that. I'm sorry. I got so my brain started doing a thing. Anyway, police think this is sketchy as fuck, naturally, because it is. It's very weird. The similarities. The dating profile alone is like, sir? What? <laughs> And now police think that there's more to Mark than like the friendly, helpful uh, witness that he had been thus far. So police actually go and ask a judge to sign off on a search warrant to go and search the garage because they're like, I bet you there's something in there and we'd like to search it officially and thoroughly. And the judge says no, actually, because they didn't have probable cause. You need probable cause to go in and start searching through people's shit. You can't just be like, I think this guy's guilty and I'd like to prove it. You have to have a reason to go in there. And they just didn't have that yet. So police are like, okay, we need, really need to get in this garage. So maybe, why don't we just, he's been cooperative before. Why don't we just ask him? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So they do just that. They call up Mark and they're like, hey, would you mind if we like search that garage again? Because we just need to. And he's like, absolutely. Just, just like he had been, he was super helpful, super friendly. And was like, yeah, absolutely. Come on over. Let's search it together. While police are there searching the garage, Mark starts telling them some really weird stuff. I don't know if he was feeling the heat 
and needed to like try to cover some, for some weird things that they might find. But he starts spilling some weird information that seems random, but is not random. Okay, so the weird stuff that Mark starts telling police is, first off, that someone had recently ransacked his car. Seems super random. Uh, he also says that somebody had recently been in his home. He couldn't prove it, but he just felt like someone had recently broke into his home and had been snooping around, looking around, maybe taking some stuff, maybe, some, maybe leaving some stuff. I don't know. He could just feel that someone had been in there. Okay. Already weird, but it's going to get even weirder. He then tells police <laughs> that about a week before he had been at a gas station when a man, a random man, had walked up to him. This man told him that he had a car he wanted to sell, that he had just met his new girlfriend and that they were going to be flying off to Costa Rica and that he needed to sell his car because he just wasn't going to need it anymore. Mark says he tells this man, he's, he's like, this is really, really weird. Um, I've only got 40 bucks on me, man. I don't know what you want to do here. And that the guy was like, okay, sold. The car is yours. And police were like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Sounds crazy. But that was Mark's story. And he was sticking to it. One of the officers who had been uh, investigating Mark said of this revelation, and I quote, this story severely raised my suspicions about Mark Twitchell. Which, yeah, that's a, the weirdest story I've ever heard in my entire life. But, I mean, it is also the story that you might want to tell police if you were worried that they were going to find a dead, well, a missing man's car in your possession. A missing man who had last been seen at your garage where you were filming a bloody horror movie. Mark. Marky boy. Marky Mark. Oh boy, oh boy. So police thinking the story is bullshit, just like I'm sure all of you do, was like, how much did you think this car was worth? Didn't you think it was odd that this random person had came up to you and was trying to unload a car? Did you think it was stolen? What did you think was going on? And he's like, yeah, dude, I thought it was totally weird, but I was gonna buy it anyway. I mean, it's a steal, $40. And I was gonna actually have the car checked out. And if it turned out it was gonna be stolen, I was gonna call you guys. Like, no big deal. I'm a good person, blah, blah, blah. Don't look over here. Uh, these are totally reasonable explanations for what's going on here. And then he told them that for whatever reason, this car was parked at a friend's house and not at his own. Mark Twitchell said of his house being ransacked, his car being ransacked and purchasing this weird car. And I quote, at this point, it seems that whoever broke into my car on the 8th used all of the information they stole to use my location and personal property for who knows what. I don't know if the person who sold me the other car is involved, but looking back, it certainly feels that way. And I have to wonder if I'm being targeted, targeted, or if it's just a nasty coincidence. Police suspecting Mark at this point and thinking that the car that he bought was probably John's. They're like, okay, can you come down to the station and give an official statement of all of this? And Mark, again, super accommodating, easily agrees. It really just feels like he thought that if he was very helpful and agreed to everything, he would get away with whatever he, whatever he did here, which we'll, you'll find out what he did. And what he did is absolutely terrible. So police bring him in. They take his statement. And this is where he writes everything down that I said. He gives a very long, like super, super long and embellished statement mentioning all the things I said above. But now he's adding to this statement that he believes that someone had been in his house, like I said, and he believed that somebody had been stealing things from his house because now he's saying that some items are missing, like trash bags and duct tape, and that it appeared that somebody had tried to burn something on his property. I just, I just don't understand with this guy, how he thought he was going to get away with this. It just seems crazy to me. Police are now able to, ooh, that's a lot. <laughs> Police are now able to get a warrant for his home and his car. And when they search his home, they find some pretty weird stuff. Things like a guide of Costa Rica, some blank postcards, and books on serial killers and forensic science. They also find a mask, a creepy like half mask that had a couple of spots on it of what looked to be blood. They then move on to Mark's car, and when they get in there, it is a big ol' mess. Maybe you could call it organized chaos, but it was 
chaos nonetheless. It seemed that Mark was a post-its guy, the type of guy who wrote everything down on little post-its in his car, to-do lists, things to remember, things like that. And of these post-its, they found some pretty weird ones, some things written on there seemed, some of these things were not like the others, okay? <laughs> there was a post-it with a list on it saying things like, ship phone while it's on, destroy wallet contents, use laptop with general Wi-Fi, kill room, clean sweep. And if that wasn't bad enough, which it does seem like it is, in the trunk, they found a large blood stain and a knife that still had blood stains on it as well. And in the front seat, they also found a giant knife with blood stains still on it, stuffed inside of a backpack. So, doesn't look good. And last, but certainly not least, police found a laptop right? And inside this laptop, there were some normal things, but there was also a file that it appeared that Mark had tried to delete. This was a file, a story called SK Confessions for Serial Killer Confessions. And sure, Mark was writing a movie about a serial killer, so finding something like this could be considered normal. But when police read it, it just seemed a little weird. It seemed to ring a little too true for comfort. In the story, he talked about how initially he, the serial killer, who was married with a daughter, just like Mark, had planned initially to kill married men who were cheating on their wives, but then decided against it because family went, family men would be missed if they suddenly went missing. So instead, he decided to target middle-aged, single men who may not be missed. In the story, the serial killer preps the killer in advance with a metal table in the center and sheets of plastic everywhere, just like freaking Dexter bro, and then waits for the victim in the kill room wearing all black and a mask. A mask that's description matched perfectly to the one that police found in Mark's home with blood spots on it. It then said that he, the serial killer, would lay in wait with a stun gun and I believe a pipe as well. He then talked about a murder, presumably John's, where he killed him, cut him up, and then tried to burn him but was unsuccessful so he put the body in his car drove around looking for a sewer, and when he found one, he dumped the body in. That story is just horrifying, right? I know that he wrote it in a way that was supposed to be fiction, but if that was what happened to John, which we'll find out later if it was or not, it's horrifying. And crazy thing is in this story, it alluded to the fact that there had been one other victim, or at least one other attempted victim, because in this story, this guy actually escaped. So. In the story, it says that he, the killer, had lured another man to the garage. The man came, came over, hoping to meet a woman. When he got there, he ducked in, ducked under the garage door that was partially open, said he could meet the woman. And as soon as he ducked in, the serial killer hit this guy with a stun gun. The guy went down. He took duct tape and he wrapped it around the eyes. But somehow, this man popped up and he fought back. He fought him back, they scuffled, and the guy escaped. Okay, so presumably, police are thinking this guy might be real, we need to find him, and spoiler alert, he was real. They do find him, and we'll get into that later. From the contents in Mark's car and also his home, police were then able to actually get a search warrant for the garage. Now, I was just thinking about it, and I don't know why police didn't just try to find like the owner of the home to get, a, to get permission instead of going through with getting a warrant, because I do believe that even if there's a tenant renting the garage, if the owner gives you permission, you can still search it. I could be wrong there. I'm gonna have to check that at work because now I just want to know. But either way, they're able to get the search warrant now and they find some real incriminating stuff. They found handcuffs, garbage bags, a stun gun, a pipe that was covered in blood, coveralls, cleaning supplies, and a bag filled with the type of knives you'd need to cut up a dead animal. And though the garage did look clean to the naked eye, there was actually little specks of blood all over the place. And when the blood spatter analyst did their little blood spatter analyzing, they found that the blood was consistent with a person being beaten to death with a pipe in that garage. In the end, police found John's blood on the walls and on the table in the garage, on the bloody pipe, in the trunk of Mark's car, and then in the trunk of his own car that Mark had, quote unquote, bought on a steak knife and on a hunting knife that were both in Mark's possession, on the tools used to carve up the animals, the, the knives that would be used to carve up animals, and on the cl clothing that was inside of Mark's house and inside of Mark's washing machine. They also found one of John's teeth 
though I could not in any articles find where this tooth was found. On Halloween, October 31st, 2008, Mark Twitchell was arrested and he was charged with first degree murder and attempted murder. The attempted murder was for that victim who police believed had gotten away, though at this point they still had not identified him. They were just like, we're gonna charge you anyway because we're gonna find this guy. So speaking of that guy, after Mark Twitchell was arrested, police went public and did a press conference where they actually showed the mask, the mask that they believed that Mark Twitchell had been wearing during John's murder and also the attempted murder, the one that they found that had the blood spots on it. And they were like, yo, we believe that somebody else was attacked by this man and had gotten away. So if you could come forward, that would be so tight. And two days later, somebody did come forward. A man named Dill came to the police and was like, yo, that's me. And he told police that the reason he never reported what happened is that he was embarrassed by what had happened to him. So he just never went to police. So while Mark was in jail, almost immediately, his wife actually filed for divorce because in addition to him being suspected for murder, which is already like a deal breaker, this guy had been straight John Liston a bitch. He had been leaving every day saying he was going to work, coming home at the end of the day saying he had been at work, but this fool hadn't worked in months. What he had been doing instead is just going to his garage, going to his parents' house, or going to his ex-girlfriend's house to bang her. So his wife was like, deuces, I'm out of this biz. This biscuit. This bitch. This biscuit bitch. Seattle, Washington. A great breakfast spot. Okay. It took police almost two years to find John's body. And when they ended up finding it, it's just because Mark Twitchell decided to tell them where it was. And it's super weird because usually you hear this when it's part of like a plea deal or something, but no, this wasn't part of a plea deal. He just did it to do it out of the goodness of his heart ugh, or because he did get a guilty conscience. I'm not sure, but he told police where the body was. I think he actually led them to the body. If I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken. I can't remember that fact clearly. When police found John's body or what was left of John's body, it was clear he had been through some shit. Um, it was just bones left and they were in pieces and the pieces they found had saw marks on them. It's just really horrible. And um, the sewer where John was found was actually just down the street from Mark's parents' house because apparently Mark had tried to burn John's body in his parents' yard while they were out of the house. Have kids, they say. It'll be fun, they say. Fuck. Mark Twitchell pled not guilty to first degree murder, even though he did admit to catfishing John and leading him to that garage. He admitted to murdering him and cutting him into pieces and burning him and putting him in the sewer. But he said this was just a big old accident. He said it was just a big old accident. It was just self-defense that when John got to the house and found that he was being catfished by a man and not a woman, that John freaked out and attacked him and that the two got in a big fight. And during the fight, Mark accidentally killed John. It was self-defense. When police asked like, why did you lure him to the garage in the first place then? He told police that this was a like PR stunt for his new movie. He wanted to create a little bit of buzz by leading men there and attacking them, but letting them live and leave like he had done with Dill, even though Dill whipped his ass and that's why he was able to live and survive. Not live and survive, leave and survive. During the trial, it actually came out that when Mark started to get on police's radar and when the police started to question people he knew and try to find out more information about him, he had started contacting his friends and telling his friends not to talk to police. He told them like, hey, listen, this isn't what it seems like. Sometimes police just get something in their head and they're wrong and they try to frame people for things they didn't do. Please don't talk to them. You know who I am, blah, blah, blah. I'm a great guy. Please um, uh, lie for me. Don't say anything. Keep your mouth shut. That'd be great. And he did this though, like right after John went missing um, before it was like a lot of heat on him. So it just seemed to be a little weird, a little weird for him to do. During the trial, it also came out that after he had uh, killed John, he had actually broken into John's apartment so that he could send those emails and update his uh, social media and his MSN and his Facebook and everything from his own computer in his home so that it would seem like he was still alive and that he had actually, I believe, stolen John's laptop and printer also after the fact so that he could keep up his ruse. The prosecutor said at trial of Mark Twitchell, and I quote, Mark Twitchell's plan was quite simply and shockingly to gain the experience of killing another human being. Mark Twitchell was ultimately found guilty of his crimes and he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole till after 25 years. The earliest Mark Twitchell will be eligible for parole is in 2036. For now, he's at the Saskatchewan Penitentiary. And what's totally wild to me is in 2013, it was reported that Mark Twitchell was given like a large flat screen TV for in his cell while he's in a maximum security prison 
and that on that TV he likes to catch up on all of the old episodes of Dexter that he missed and to watch reruns of Dexter while in prison for murdering a man in a Dexter-inspired murder. In 2017, it was also reported that Mark Twitchell is on a dating site for convicts. Apparently that's a thing in Canada is you can make dating profiles so that you can date from a distance other convicts. He wrote on the Canadian Inmate Connect, searching for his partner, and I quote, I'm looking for an interesting, intellectual, open-minded, delightfully imperfect woman to relate to and share amusing observations with, as well as a potentially long weekend every few months, if it gets there naturally. What? That just seems so wild to me. I know nothing of the Canadian justice system, but to me, it seems crazy that this man would, one, get a TV, okay, that he would, two, be able to watch reruns and episodes of the show Dexter, which inspired his murder, Okay, and three, be able to use a dating site, which is how he lured his murder victim to be murdered in the first place. Am I fucking crazy here, or do you feel the same? It just seems insane, but hey, maybe that's just me. Anyways, that, my friends, is the story of John Altinger, the horrible the horribly unlucky murder victim of Mark Twitchell, the Dexter-inspired killer. What do you think? Isn't that just so fucked up and unbelievable? Like, what a dick Mark was. Can you even imagine what John went through? Like, you're just a single guy. You're trying to meet somebody, you're trying to find somebody to spend some time with, to relate to, to care about, and you get to this garage to find some fucking guy wearing a mask, who ambushes you and murders you and cuts you into pieces because he is a dick and wants to know what killing somebody feels like and wants to be like Dexter Morgan. Come on, man. That's so lame. Like, what a loser. Take away his TV. Take away the dating sites. This guy does not deserve to live the type of life he's living when he stole one from this man for no reason. Like, come on, man. Get it together, Canada. You guys are too nice. <laughs> You're being too nice to him. Fuck that guy. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering John with me today, man, because he just sounded like a nice guy, like a smart guy and a friendly guy and a quirky guy, just like a good friend and a good brother. And he was just like stolen from them for no reason. And his life was stolen from him for no reason, except for that this guy wanted the thrill of killing another person. And that's just like such a waste because now he's dead and he's in jail. And like, what was even the point? It's just all so stupid. Murdering people is so stupid, isn't it? Like, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? All the time, I'm like, if we're talking about it, that means you probably got caught, which means you're stupid, which means it was all for naught. Like, what's the point, man? God, it's just very sad. But anyways. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below. As you know, I have a very long list of cases, but every time you suggest one, I put your name on a list with the case so I can give you a shout out for your suggestion because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise, you would not be here with me today. Now, watching me just get very upset. <laughs> of course, if you haven't already, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you and if you want to hang out more consistently you can follow me on all my social media everything's linked down below for your convenience instagram twitter facebook page and a facebook group as well as all the makeup i've used the earrings the nail polish if you want any of that it's also listed down below along with my merch if you haven't picked this up yet this is the one we have right now and okay i'm releasing a new shirt what's today november 1st is when i'm uploading this my birthday is november 4th scorpio Mm, eh. Anyways, my birthday is November 4th and I'm going to be dropping a new shirt on my birthday that I think you guys will love. I might have a video going up that day if I can get another video filmed, which I do not know if I'll be able to. Um, but if not, just check down below for the link to my shop and there will be a brand new launch. Maybe I'll give you guys a sneak peek now and put it up on the screen, like a quick flash. Maybe I won't. If I remember, let me know if I put that in editing. But um, that will be available on November 
forth and I hope you love it as much as me and my husband do because he was the one who designed it, came up with the concept together, but he is the artist. So down below for my merch link for your pleasure. <laughs> And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At the very least, be a better person than Mark Twitchell. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.